Hi, I'm here with Andrew Blaine, the founder of Remote AF or the Remote Agility Framework. How are you today, Andrew? I'm great, Tony. How are you? Yeah, brilliant. Look, I've said you're the founder of Remote AF, but I think it would be really good for people to hear about where you came from and, and, and who you are. Yeah, sure. So um, I live in Melbourne in Australia, uh, actually a little bit out of Melbourne. I'm in a little country town called Woodend, uh, which is about 70 kilometres north of Melbourne in the mountains. Um, and my background is in technology. Uh, about 11 or 12 years ago, I started a consultancy uh, called Elaborate, which probably became Australia's leading lean agile consultancy. And that's where I first met Tony. Um, and yeah, over about a decade, we worked with organizations large and small from the uh, very first sort of digital uh, startups in Australia that, that, that sort of became those larger companies, right through to big enterprises on the challenge of how do you deliver products and services faster and with higher quality. Um, and obviously, Agile was at the heart of that. About a couple of years ago, we uh, saw that COVID was going to create a, a groundswell movement towards remote working. And we didn't think that there was anything in the market that really helped organizations with the challenge of how do you build a sustainable remote organization? So uh, along with Tony and a small team, um, I started Remote AF, which started off as the Remote Agility Framework, but then someone said Remote AF sounds funnier, so we kind of stuck with that. Brilliant, yeah. yeah. And we, we, we are well aware of the connotations, of, I suppose, because a lot of people ask, Remote AF, do you know? Yes, we do. But we thought it was funny, like you said. And Andrew, I think one of the things that might be interesting and, and I'd like to cover is and what I got you on today is a lot of people have heard about it. We've been running about two years now, um, but we still get asked the question, what is the remote agility framework and where did it come from? So, you know, I know you're very passionate about this being our founder. So I think it's poignant that um, we hear from you. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a lot of information out there about how to run remote teams and I suppose playbooks for how you make a team work effectively in the remote context. Uh, the kind of work that we'd been doing for a decade before we started this was working with larger programs. So distributed teams internationally, um, where you'd have a, say a team in the UK, you'd have a team in India, you'd have a team in Australia, um, and you might have individuals in different parts of the world and you were trying to make those things work uh, and obviously there's some stuff out there that helps with that but there wasn't really anything that specifically said or oh, here's how to make a remote organization sustain when the pandemic kicked off we did some strategic planning and the first thing that we thought was well this will be the movement that makes working from home or working from anywhere eventually uh, stick and we saw that there was a huge amount of social and environmental benefit potential in that shift. Um, and I suppose as a group, we, we decided that if we could build something that helps medium organisations and even larger organisations with the challenge of not just making a remote team successful for the pandemic, but making the organisation sustainably successful beyond the pandemic, then we can keep people out of offices, we can keep people out of cities, we can stop the meaningless and uh, environmentally costly commute, we can stop people flying around the world and, and around their countries for meetings that could be done like this. Um, and more importantly, Tony would never have to leave Bribey Island to go to work, which I think was your motivation for getting right behind this. Absolutely, living on an island definitely, definitely was a, a pick up for Tony. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me pick up a bit deeper on that though. Um, the sustainability piece, because I know that you're really passionate about that. As we all, you know, when we were putting this together, we were all very passionate about the sustainability piece. 
Talk to me a little bit deeper about that because I think that's one of the real defining factors here about what we're trying to do. Yeah, look, I think it's hard. It's hard to talk about the. It's it's hard to talk about the challenges that we're facing at the moment as a global community without things feeling like they're a little bit too big. And I suppose I'd I'd spent probably the last five or ten years kind of thinking, you know, I'd really love to have an impact um, in this space, but not really being able to see any way that you could meaningfully do it. I mean, you can uh, you can cut down your personal consumption, you can recycle better, you can think about what you're putting into your body, you can think about how you're traveling and, and that kind of thing. But it it just it, yeah, I mean buying green energy and all that all those little things which are important but it doesn't it never felt like you could really do something that was meaningful on a uh on a big scale and that's one of the challenges i suppose with consulting is you're working with a lot of organizations you're seeing the same sort of patterns um and you just can't sometimes you feel like you're just a cog in a wheel and there's really not a lot going on so what it, we, we kind of we had a hypothesis which was tested, proven by research that if you can get people out of offices and get them working remotely, uh, you can have a pretty significant impact. You can have an impact on the peak hours on the roads for white collar workers at least, which reduces the um, road related emissions. Um, you can certainly cut a lot, of, a lot of carbon out from flights that uh, unnecessarily unnecessary with remote work. Um, but there wasn't there wasn't a real groundswell movement for remote work before 2020. It was just a few pockets around the world that were doing it. And yeah, we had flexible working policies and stuff like that. But um, it was hard to make something like that stick. You had to build up trust with your leader. They had to let you do it. And then um, it'd be sort of a delicate negotiation for the duration of your relationship with that leader followed by a new negotiation if you had a change of leader. The pandemic shifts all that. Um, pandemic meant that there was a whole bunch of capital that flowed to the problem. So leaders had to trust that their people would be able to work from home because their people were working from home regardless. Um, that's massive amount of trust capital. You had a huge amount of intellectual capital. So you had to teach your parents how to Zoom call their grandkids. You had to teach your great grandparents, if you have them, who are in nursing homes, how to communicate with you over a Zoom call. Um, so some of the some of the learning barriers to adoption were broken down by that intellectual capital. There was financial capital that was thrown at the problem and continues to be thrown at the problem. So Zoom had a heap of financial capital come into it, and uh, you saw the same thing with platforms like. Mural and Miro and Teams and, uh, and, a, and a whole bunch of other things. So the, the money's flowing into the problem. Um, and that's, that just removes the inertia, uh, as, as Simon Wardley would put it. it. It takes the inertia out of something which was emerging and pushes it straight into the mainstream. So we were, we were kind of looking at that and thinking, all right, so this is all really good and the average pandemic is sort of two to three years uh, long, depending on what happens. And I think we're seeing that play out now. It seems to be starting to at least we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> What's going to happen at the end of the pandemic? Um, and what we hypothesised back in 2020 was that you'd have some dead money that would be sitting there. So there'd be, there's capital in the airlines, there's capital in corporate offices and, and uh, the occupancy of those corporate offices. There's capital in and around retail in cities and all the services that support people coming in and out of cities, be it transport, be it uh, your rail networks, your, your taxi companies, all that sort of thing. That capital would have to be dormant while the pandemic was... Uh, carrying out its uh, the virus was doing its thing but it's the conclusion of all that that dormant capital is going to come and it's going to try and push people back into the office 
so I suppose what we were spe- speaking about right back from uh, March 2020 is how do you uh, how do you build something that proves to organisations that they can sustain this way of working beyond the pandemic um, and unlock those uh, environmental benefits that we saw and also some of the social benefits that we saw from it. Um, we were like, well, if we can do that, wow, we we can actually have an impact here. Like if we can work with 50 organisations, 100 organisations in the next couple of years and, and train a bunch of people up, we can have a pretty significant impact on what's going on beyond the pandemic and therefore the uh, the environmental impacts of the return to work. Yeah, and I think that, that that brings us to a good little segue there because you said if we can build something that shows that or can help with that or or transforms into that. So that that, that that's the question. All right, well, what really is the remote agility framework? Yeah. Um, so as I said earlier, there's a bunch of playbooks you can get out there. So GitLab's got a playbook. Uh, is, Basecamp's got a playbook. There's a, there's a bunch of playbooks out there that kind of tell you these are the sort of things you should do to be a an effective remote team. Um, you can kind of follow those playbooks similar to what you could do with something like Scrum and a team can get up and running and be relatively effective uh, and to a certain scale with the right kind of leadership and the right kind of people. So people that have got, that are self-starters, um, that are motivated and engaged in the purpose of an organization, those sort of teams are going to be sustainably successful. There's not a lot of stuff out there, or at least there wasn't stuff out there at the start of the pandemic that says, all right, well, how do you manage the gaps between teams? How do you manage programs of work where you've got uh, multiple teams that are working together towards an objective? How do you run operational teams uh, remotely where it's not about um, some sort of enduring uh, goal that we're trying to solve problems. It's more about how we're serving customers effectively. Um, how do you connect the different types of teams in an organization? How do you make this, keep the social networks in an organization uh, stimulated as uh, w- without the water cooler conversations? And then on top of that, there was the questions of, well, how do you govern a remote organization? So how do you shift from a, a governance model that relies a lot on face-to-face communication, on visibility via things on walls or by being able to walk around and see what people are doing and make sure they're doing the right thing? How do you shift to a distributed governance model? How do you build a an operating model that uh, makes the most of the constraints that you now have which are different like uh office an office constrains you in certain ways uh a distributed workforce constrains you in different ways how do you make sure that you're taking advantage of those constraints where possible and not just designing an office experience outside the office we were thinking about how do you lead effectively in the remote context? How do you remain connected to your people? How do you have hard conversations when you're not able to control the space that you're in? Um, and then things like, uh, I suppose, how do you uh, how do you take an organisation with a bunch of remote execs and, and, and remote teams and actually define a strategy and have that strategy cascade down the teams for execution? So it became less about how do we make teams effective and kind of more about how do we make the organization effective regardless of where people are. And more recently, obviously, um, some of our customers have been talking about hybrid and uh, the idea of returning to the office maybe one or two days a week, um, much to the chagrin of uh, of their employees, it seems. Um, But those organizations that are looking to come back one or two days a week, what is that hybrid model operating model look like um look at how do we make the most of that time that we are together and make sure that the work that we're doing together is the most valuable work for from a collaboration perspective so there yeah 
that, that's the problem that RAF solves. It's a framework for helping you to navigate uh, the challenges of remote and hybrid working. Um, it's about helping people to ask the right questions and then to allow uh, operating models, um, processes, uh, frameworks and everything else to emerge to suit the organisation that, uh, that it's been rolled out in. So, so that brings me to a question I get asked quite regularly and, and I really do want to address that here because, um, you know, it's an industry of certifications, if you like, that we've seen rise and rise and rise. And so it often gets thrown thrown our way as, are you just another certification scheme? What are your thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah, look, I think certification is an interesting business model. Um, and it's certainly been a proven business model. Uh, people have done pretty well at a certification. What is the challenging aspect of certification? Well, what we've seen in practice is that you can get a certificate pretty easily. The learning experience for getting a certificate varies greatly uh, from product to product and also from issuing body to issuing body. And uh, as a general rule, we're not seeing that people with certifications are necessarily being uh, taken on the learning journey that you need to in order to at least get to the point where you can start to uh, role model what good looks like. So with RAF, there's kind of a few different learning models. Um, the base learning model is we do a little bit of sort of mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning over a multi-week period with a group. Um, and then they become part of a community. And the idea is that the community meets regularly to uh, to work out both where to take the product, but also to help each other with things. Um, and that's kind of, that's for the things that sort of fit at that team or program level in the framework. Um, and then we've got executive patterns like governance, uh, like operating model design, like strategy, where it's not really easy to download the 15 or 20 years of experience that you need in order to understand how to do those things effectively. You can't run a, a couple of days training course and expect that someone's going to be capable. So the only way that we can really see those things being delivered effectively is if people are participating in the process of doing things and learning from a mentor as they go about it. So we anticipate with the executive patterns that they'll scale slower um, because we'll be constrained by the number of people who are effective at teaching them. But as we bring people on the journey of learning how to use things, then eventually they become the teachers uh, and, and through that model, we'll slowly uh, build the ability to scale things out. Yeah, let's expand on that just a little a little tad because I think that everybody's going to be asking that. Been going for two years, you've sort of given the, the, the length and the breadth of it now. Where's it headed? Where where is the where is the next step forward for remote agility framework? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we got the the basic patterns, which are pretty simple, uh, launching teams and 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 running how to launch an effective remote team and to guide that team through the event, events that it needs to have in place in order to remain effective over time. That's a pretty simple pattern. We've got the same sort of pattern, but rolled up to the program or, or the, the divisional level. So how do you bring a group of remote teams on a journey to be effective? So how do you launch them effectively? Uh, how do you plan acro effectively across those teams? How do you reflect on performance as, as a group and get better? And how do you um, how do you demo stuff in the remote environment um, in in a way that doesn't just eat up everyone's time on endless VCs? Um, so, kind of got those patterns that are pretty straightforward and they're they're quite mature. They're being used in I think you could probably easily say that they're being used in hundreds of organisations now uh, globally. Um, then there's the stuff that sits on top. So yourself and Esther and the 
team are working on governance. Um, governance is a higher order pattern. It's going to have a smaller community who are interested in it. Um, we'll probably be launching that in March uh, with the intent that we should be starting to do the first work with it in April and May. It's been beta tested in a few organisations now with some success. Uh, we've just got to basically mould it into a finished product. So that'll be uh, that'll be a pattern for helping organisations to navigate that challenging question of uh, how much transparency, how much trust, uh, how much consistency do we need in our processes versus how much can we let teams work out how they're going to do things themselves and really trying to find the right points in those uh, on those ten tension th th those those little points of tension for the different parts of their organization and, and be fit for context um following that we'll be looking to put a working group together a, a global working group together to take the stuff that we've built on strategy and turn that into a similar executive pattern um so this is how do you set the directional intent for a remote organization where uh, it's a kind of work that people have traditionally done in rooms, um, which we've done successfully now with a number of organizations who are, who've had to work remotely from each other. Uh, and operating model design, look, that's a proven pattern that we've used for nearly five years. It's just about trying to find out how to scale it out when you need to know a lot to effectively help an organization design an operating model. You kind of had to have to have run uh, programs of work and you need to have seen a few of them to see what can go wrong. So um, yeah, trying to work out how to scale that out would be interesting as well. So that's the, that's the, the kind of, I suppose the, the bits of the framework that we're filling out um, from a, overall product perspective we're also looking at how do we dis distribute what we've done as it becomes more stable through some of the more common platforms uh, that are out there um, and also how do we start uh, how do we start using remote af as kind of a a place where people go to both market their own ideas their own products their own services that solve the emerging challenges that remote organizations present so we're looking to uh we're really looking to build a community of uh amazing people who are passionate about making this stuff sustain longer term and giving them a a, a platform to share their ideas great that's yeah and i see that, that that really shows the direction of where we're headed the other question i've got because you've touched on it we've touched on it right through we know that you know COVID, COVID was the lightning rod for this this particular remote working and the the, the the uptake across the world. Although in Australia it wasn't just that, that's why I was sort of uh, umming there a little bit because we we had you know the perfect cocktail of the the bushfires and the floods, and then we followed it in with COVID. So you know we did the pestilence and everything else <laughs> that went with it, right? Um, we had the rats. Sorry, the mice as well. We had the oh, mice. we had the mice as well. That's right. So we had and the <laughs> However, where are we headed now? So you can see the pandemic starting to become endemic. We'll always have those things, those events where where you, you do get driven to this. But where is the... Because one of the things you're hearing out there at the moment, Andrew, and I'm sure you, you're talking to people just as much as me, there's the, the great, the supposed great resignation. There's the great embracing of I only want to work from home. And then there are the organisations that have embraced it in totality that are actually out there saying, well, come and work for us because we are completely remote. We'll look after you. So, so where are you seeing this? Because we hear remote, we hear hybrid, we hear distributed, we hear location agnostic. Thoughts? Yeah, so I think the inertia that prevented remote from being adopted was originally technology. Uh, but the technology problems were pretty well solved by the time we hit COVID. Um, so I think the remaining inertia for that move was two things. One, people are a little bit slow to change outside of a crisis. And two, the trust capital that was required. So the crisis 
provoked mass change and people will change in a crisis. Yeah. It also forced the conversation around trust. Um, and now it's people have proven that they're effective. In fact, a lot of organizations, the metrics are showing that teams are much more effective remotely um, or at least certain types of teams. So we're not going back but we are going to move forward. Um, and what does moving forward look like? So I, th I think there's one pathway, which is hybrid. And it'll be really interesting to see how organizations navigate that challenge. We've probably seen 50 or 60 models in 50 or 60 organizations that we've spoken with. Everyone's trying new things there. Um, the people who've been doing it for a while, uh, basically, the lessons that you can learn from those organizations is that if you can make work a social space, if you can make it a collaborative space, if you can make it somewhere where people go to build their informal networks as much as they go to work, then that's the sort of model that works in hybrid. Um, another pathway is uh, the work from anywhere or the digital nomad pathway. So we still have some technology inertia that would prevent you from being effective as you traveled around without a fair bit of work. But things like near earth satellites, the Starlink being released, um, we've seen some interesting products emerging around kind of the idea of distributed workplaces. So you can, you can drop a workplace into your backyard that you can rent out to other people. Um, or you can just take space in a coffee shop or in a uh, in a in a in someone else's building with a solution like liquid space or something like that. So we're starting to see the the things that would have pre prevented people from doing that digital nomad thing breaking down a bit as well. And hopefully that means that uh, you don't really need to take a gap year to travel anymore you can kick your career off and travel at the same time, uh, see a bunch of stuff and still show up to work. Maybe you don't want to be working five days a week when you're traveling, but uh, three or four days a week uh, to keep the money rolling in whilst you're visiting some pretty cool places sounds like a, a good thing to me. Um, and then I think there's possibly a third future, um, which is hard to get it, it, it's it's the breaking down of borders in terms of talent. Um, so I'm already starting to hear from the executives that I speak to that where they've outsourced to places like the Philippines or to Vietnam or to India, wage pressure has come on big time in those uh, in those areas because you no longer have to live in Silicon Valley to work in Silicon Valley. And the top talent in those companies, particularly in high demand functions like technology, are finding that they can apply for these remote jobs and they can demand uh, equivalent wages to people who are living in the cities where the organisations come from. So that's I think that's kind of disrupting a little bit that satellite office business model where you set up a satellite office for someone and you hire staff for them and you manage them because those staff are increasingly going direct. And from a social equity perspective, we, we see that as a really good thing. Um, if, if people can stay in their local communities and earn Western money, then that's great with the caveat that we can't have this endless uh, growth story without hitting some sort of ecological ceiling. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's two sides to every every coin, right? But yeah, I think they're the three things that we'll be watching for. First one again would be the, uh, the hybrid model. Second one, the rise of the digital nomad. And the third one being uh, a more equitable uh, employee experience across borders. Yeah, I'm all for that equitable one where I sit on an island and don't have to go anywhere, right? So yeah, that <laughs> you works. Stop the bridge at one point during COVID. <laughs> I don't know whether you were trying to keep people out or keep yourself in. Yeah, well, I think a bit of both. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, Andrew, that's fantastic. We're at the end of our time. So thank you for spending the time with us today. Um, 
obviously to get a hold of us it's it's remoteaf.com how but how can they get in touch with you if they want to touch base yeah you can find me on linkedin you can hassle me on twitter um i think i'm andrew james blaine on linkedin i'm aj blaine on twitter from memory um <laughs> but yeah if, you can find me i'm i'm out there um or just uh, just get in touch with us join the community at raf and uh yeah, ping me on the Slack channel. Fantastic. Look, if you like this episode, uh, viewers, uh, please like us, subscribe. Thanks for thanks for tuning in today. Thanks, Tony.